Hello and welcome to Sounding Board, a community access television production of Seroptimus International of Novato. My name is Madeline Peters and my guest today is Dr. Chase Clow, whom I will have introduce herself a little bit more in a moment. But I'd like to provide you with a little more information about Seroptimus International. The mission of Seroptimus International is improving the lives of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic empowerment. Well, Dr. Chase Cloud, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say a little bit about yourself. You and I have known each other for quite a few years since both of us are involved at Dominican University of California as professors. So, but thank you very much for taking the time. And I do want to mention the title, you know, that we talked about, The Four Dimensions of Photographic Vision. So um, why don't right. you say a little bit more about yourself and your incredible work? Thank you, Madeline, so much for having me on the show. It's such a delight to be here and to have an opportunity to share my work with the uh, Marin community. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay. So I welcome. want to talk a little bit about three communities that I belong to that have been really central to my photographic practice and to my research. And the first, of course, is Dominican University, where I currently serve as, the, as you know, as the Assistant Professor of Humanities and as the Chairperson for the Department of Humanities, Religion, and Philosophy. And uh, another very important organization in my life is the International Association of Sufism, which I've belonged to since its exception in um, 1980s. I've been a practitioner of Sufi meditation all of those years, and it's a heart-based meditation. And uh, finally, the California Institute of Integral Studies, where I recently completed my PhD in the Transformative Studies Department. And uh, this is a department that's looking at uh, ways in which we transform both self and society, and is really on the cutting edge of academia in that it's um, asking us to ask research questions that can only be answered by, through the lens of multiple disciplines. So it's what they call it transdisciplinary inquiry. Well, it's interesting listening to your background and the organizations that are important to you and sort of form a blend of who you are and how you practice, how you do what you do. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to me. I know that historically that there's been an, uh, a push at the, at the higher education level to really have universities shift their focus to be more in, uh, integral. Mm -hmm. And and here you are, you're sort of the embodiment of that and yes. what you choose to do professionally and the associations with which you're organized. But, yes. uh, so it's like that background matches. It's, it's, it's very nice. It's very, you know, I understand on a different level what you bring to your practice. Thank you. But let's get into you know your work now, your specific work that brought you here today. Yes, thank you. So I wanted to share a little bit about my research um, in the academic research and my photographic practice. And I'd like to do that through the lens of a project that I've been working on in southern Nevada and the Pacheco Valley area. I've lived there uh, since the late 1990s and I've been actively photographing the area for about eight years. And in that process, um, have learned a, a lot about how to see and, and inhabit the places where we live and to come to a greater sense of connection and wholeness through that. Um, and also in the practice of doing the research into landscape photography, learning a tremendous amount from other photographers about how to be present in place and the kinds of knowledge and awareness that arises through photographic practice. Which was interesting given the discussions that we had preparing for this program too. Uh, you brought up some uh, photographers that uh, I know and admire and yes. you helped me see their work in a different light. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it helped me understand, perhaps I'll, I'll use the term the struggle, Mm -hmm. sort of like the struggles that maybe these photographers experienced in, in trying to represent themselves as artists yes. and showcase their work as art, not just as part of uh, 
a way to kind of earn money and make mm -hmm. their way in life, but something more deeper and richer. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because, uh, first of all, landscape photography is, is, has not been addressed to a great degree in the academy, mm -hmm. so as a research topic. But those who are focusing on landscape photography are typically um, critical of the, of, the, uh, of the images that are produced, often either the, for the, what the aesthetic is and or the role that photographs play in society in shaping our understanding of the environment and our behaviors. And what's fascinating is that while those are really important dimensions, of course, the, the aesthetic appeal of the image and what the image does as a cultural artifact, very little has been done to look at how photographers themselves experience the moment of making the image and the values that drive what they're doing. And so it's in a sense almost the phenomenology of photography. So looking at photography as an inquiry and as a practice of aligning your heart and your mind in order to explore and expand and see yourself in connection with the earth and the cosmos. Well, to me, just what you've said, it moves photography beyond what may be interpreted as technical into something that's very authentic and really yes. reflects the uh, insight and emotion yes. and the talents that the photographer brings Right, to as with images. any art practice, right. of course, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. But it's it's helpful to hear you say that yeah. and to have this discussion. I'm, and you know, I'm not sure in any readings I've done in the past uh, or my own interest in photography mm -hmm. that I really understood it on quite that deep a level as right. you're able to express right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and and certainly I'm able to express that because I spent so much time reading what photographers have said. You, you, you know, we can see their work on one aspect in terms of the images that they produce, and that tells us one thing about them and what their vision is and what they see. But when you take time to really analyze um, how they talk about what they're doing, what's driving them, then, it, then it, this, so many other dimensions come forward, and their heart begins to come mm -hmm. forward. And that's been, that's been a really beautiful learning for me and a great opportunity to engage with some phenomenal people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, I understand, too, from your discussion, you've really developed a framework almost. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. that's not the proper word, yeah. but it's a, it helped clarify for me an understanding of how one, how a, mem a member of the community might uh, view landscape photography. Yes. So in, in analyzing all of these photographic texts, and in this case I am talking about written texts, as I've said, or interviews that photographers gave, and, um, and this is primarily looking at photographers in the United States from the turn of the 20th century until today. and. Um, photographers of place and landscape. So nature photographers, outdoor photographers, landscape photographers, but um, not necessarily urban photographers. Um, the, the, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, but yeah. we're just talking about uh, what the photographers yes. and the, Okay, uh, the framework. So yeah. in any case, in analyzing their writings, beginning to see that there are at least four dimensions of photographic vision that, um, and, the, and in a sense almost stages of vision in mm -hmm. terms of the kinds of insights and awareness that arise through sustained attention to place and, and sustained attention to oneself in place and as a photographer. And so my research looks at what are those dimensions and begins to sort of classify and categorize those dimensions. Well, I know you've yeah. identified those dimensions and you're going to talk about that yes. and that uh, we have the images, actually they are your images, mm -hmm. yes. uh, and they're images of place very important to where we are right now, mm -hmm. which is really a, quite a gift that you're giving us. So I'd like you Thank to, you. Uh, if you could, wouldn't mind describing that kind of the dimensions of um, sure. vision. Great. Thank you. So again, bearing in mind this is a, over an eight-year process of photographing the same location time and time again in different circumstances and, and um, different seasons. 
and the the and then bringing in the light of the other photographers and how they talk about it. The one of the dimensions of photographic practice or vision is looking. So just simply looking. Simply looking, which which we might describe as that sense of being called to see something and and uh, being filled with mystery and wonder and delight at, um, and that delight may be in how it makes us feel or how it looks, right? It's aesthetic appeal. Um, is so the images that I've selected to show to the audience that reflect this for me are that one shows the, the light as the fog has lifted in the forest and it's streaming through the forest trees and you get this sense of, of awe and delight at, at the, the beauty of the land that we occupy. And um, another image, uh, just sort of the, that misty morning um, where, where the fog still is there and things are, some things are visible and some things aren't. And so you really has a sense of mystery. And another image where um, it's early morning very peaceful, the light is just rising, no one's awake, and it's before sort of the bustle of the neighborhood begins, and you feel a calm sense of connection to something greater than yourself and greater than your, but you know, the fact that you're trying to get ready for work and get off and go <laughs> do the things that you have to do, right? So that, that idea of, of looking is, is just a response to that moment, I guess, and, and in, in a sense, almost a surface response. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seems to me as though it's very connected with um, the different, uh, the description that you made of the things, of the agencies that influence who you are and that you're closely connected with. And uh, as you talked about these pictures, these images, um, there was a certain uh, mystical feeling that I experienced yes. just in your description. Yes. I understand and have seen, experienced that sort of um, misty, softness, calmness, right. you know, a very, very rare time of the day, yes. as you say, that where you perhaps, where one perhaps looks in a different way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then over the course then of this, this photographic practice and time in Pacheco Valley, another dimension of vision became evident. And this also uh, through reading Edward Weston in particular, this idea of seeing. And seeing is where one begins to recognize the significance of what one is mm -hmm. studying or encountering. And, and that, is, that might be the relationships that exist within that, that this thing that you're looking at is, is not in isolation, but exists as part of a larger whole. And what role is it playing in that larger whole? And um, so I, I chose to show a couple of the images of the animals that live in this woodland, and um, including the turkeys that are doing a mating. <laughs> a mating. There's two males who are, who are vying for a hen. She's not in the image, but they're doing their dance, which is so provocative and beautiful. And then another image of, of a deer. And, um, and then also recognizing that, that this woodland that's right outside my back door also doesn't exist in isolation. It is part of, that's surrounded by people, by houses. So one of the images is looking out through the trees and you see the cars. And so you begin to see that it's in relationship to something else. And then um, another image is looking at the park and you see a sign where it says, adopt this place. And we, <laughs> you know, we begin to see that, that we really are having an effect on this land and on this place, and, and our actions really do matter. And, um, and so we, we, we need to care for these places that we inhabit. So that's, so that's the seeing dimension, is right. understanding those relationships. So I, can, uh, I see, from, you know, from going from looking to seeing, yes. there's a, a surface level, and then there's an increasing depth. Yes. And I think the probably the connection that you made, too, you initially said we're, it's something part larger and that the pictures that you've chosen for this section, it, to me, it helps me stand back and take a look, not just at the particular setting, perhaps, but right. now the setting in a larger context. That's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then a, another dimension of seeing, and I, and I want to be careful to not say that these are necessarily stages of progress in seeing, because 
some of these dimensions are happening simultaneously. And, and a seasoned photographer may have those moments of just looking and being delighted, right? It doesn't mean that as you go, you're getting to this place and that you're never then returning to another place. Mm -hmm. these, are, these, these are all simultaneously taking place. But another dimension of vision is witness. And, and that's where we begin to see that not everything is whole and beautiful, right? Some things are broken. Some things need our care and attention. And, and you, we feel a sort of an urgency to, to call attention to what's broken so that others also can see and know about it. And then we can begin to think about how do we either modify our behavior so that we're not having the effects that we're having, um, or how do we leave these areas alone so that they can recover, or, or whatever it is. But in any case, it's this sense of witness and care. And um, so I chose images that reflect the um, disease that's happening in, in this woodland and actually ultimately throughout um, Marin County and along the West Coast. The, 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 the largest factor being the um, Phytophthorum remorum, which causes sudden oak death. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating about this is that the, the spore that causes that was inadvertently brought to this area by the landscaping industry and through rhododendron plants coming from Southeast Asia in the 1990s. And then um, quickly, because oh, wow. it's waterborne, quickly spread. And, and so Marin County is kind of ground zero oh, for, for P. Remorum. And which is now spread as again a, 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 along the entire coast, but actually now throughout the world, from what the scientists are saying, and it's wreaking havoc on Absolutely. our. I mean, uh, and so these trees, right. they eventually get strangled. What happens is the spore gets in, it 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 it, it circles the inside of the tree. It can't get the nourishment that it needs, and so whole branches will just begin to fall off of the tree, and eventually the whole tree will the collapse. Tree yes, and so you'll see in these images all of the detritus that's on the ground as these trees are shedding their their branches. And then I also show another image um, for the audience that's looking at the sooty mold that's infecting all of the leaves of these trees uh, because the pests, these trees are weakened. Now they're vo more vulnerable to pests. The, these pests are further weakening them. And of course, the drought has been weakening them further and global climate change. So it's a it's it's, this integration. It's of pretty profound. Insults. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I th it's amazing to me. I've never really heard the description, the way you've carefully articulated it about the um, invasion or, or the appearance of sudden oak, oak death and then. Yes. As you said, I've never heard anyone describe this area as ground zero for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and that where it spread because it's it's not just on the west coast. It's as you said, it's it's throughout Pretty the world. Pretty much everywhere seeing, now. And, yeah. and it's easy to see on when you're driving extensive distances. You can just see the changes in the trees. And you know, yes. I, I'm not seasoned. No, but in the forest knowledge, loss. But it's like it's it's pretty apparent that exactly. something's not healthy here. That's right. That's right. Yeah, the Oak Mortality Task Force is here in Marin County, and that's an extent. I think. Um, well, Dominican is definitely involved in uh, this right, research, that, and a lot of people from UC Berkeley and other institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least I think what's very helpful for me is here you are as this artist, and you are uh, very concerned with place. You're very concerned with home, and you you're documenting through your artwork. Yeah. Obviously, the incredible beauty, the connection to us as a community, and also to me, you're bringing up the concept of responsibility for care yes. and paying attention. So each dimension you're talking about gives me the opportunity to step back a little bit more and, right. and understand, step back a little bit more. So but they're all re interrelated because it's all part of the whole. Right. Right. And so then the next dimension being reflection. And reflection is really that state of where one is, is as aware of the internal landscape as one is aware of the external landscape and the interaction between these two. So the way in which you're being shaped by the land and the way that the land, um, you are also shaping the land, mm -hmm. and, the, and the stories that the land holds because of the progression of time. 
and and the it would be in this particular case I'm showing images of walking in the creek bed of Pacheco Creek which is it's in sometimes up to 30 feet sort of below surface level and there's been a lot of erosion and now the 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 root structures of some of these very old trees are very evident and as I've walked through this um, creek bed, of course, I've become very aware of the fact that it's been here a long time. I'm a very recent inhabitant of an ecosystem that's been there for a long time. And um, the, the forces, as I say, sort of the, the geological forces that are shaping it, um, but also that this is a land that's been occupied by different peoples over, over time. So I, it's made me this, even especially this concept of roots, recognizing my own ancestral roots, but also the ancestral roots of this place. So becoming very aware and thinking about those Miwok groups that we know occupied this valley because there's a midden in the valley that they found when they were developing the area. Thinking about them, how they were utilizing these trees, the relationship that they had with this forest, the fact that their presence is still there if we think of layers of time, right? That, that is sure. that we're in the stream of time together, inhabitants of a same area that we're sharing. And that to me is a very, very profound knowing of recognizing oneself as being something, as being a, a part of time, right? And well, well, again, you're moving in my mind, in the from when we started the conversation, from more the specific, and the my from my perspective, my looking, yes, to another level, my seeing, mm -hmm. the concept of witnessing, yeah. and then reflecting each one of those stages, as you um, described, is a way to kind of step. For me, what I would say is I can step outside myself a little bit That's more. That's right. That's right. Deeper and deeper. Right and our broader and broader understanding that we are not in isolation, that we live as part of a greater whole. And that, of course, then extends into the entire cosmos, mm -hmm. however you want to recognize what that is and define it. Yeah. Well, your concept, or that we know when we first start, talked about this, uh, landscape photography as art, you know, certainly, um, probably, you know, people have an initial idea of what that means. It's a pretty picture. It's a scene. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's, a, it's very interesting to me, the levels of depth yes. that one can experience. That's right. Uh, by uh, the way you've described these sort of dimensions of vision. Mm -hmm. Again, because emphasizing that it's practice, right? It's not just the photographic image that that arises when one makes that, and which is a reflection of both the external reality, but also a reflection of one's relationship with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we've talked about quite a few things today. Uh, I think certainly it's, it's really lovely to have the description, uh, have your background, what you've done in terms of your inquiry, your research. Yeah. Um, we have about five more minutes left. Is there something that you would like to highlight that connects how this has affected your practice, um, this knowledge has affected your practice and your continuing inquiry? Yeah. I would, I would basically like to emphasize that, that the camera is an extension of the heart and of the mind. It's, it is a, it's a means of inquiry and of coming to know. And that, I think that's a really important concept to get, that, it, that it, it, is, it is a part of us, right? It's just expanding and extending our vision. And in this case, I'm talking about the vision of the heart and the vision of the mind, of course, a way of exploring. And that um, I really want to encourage people to think of their cameras as that, as that tool, and to really engage in the places they inhabit and begin to see the relationships that exist there. Because one of the things that we all know is, is certainly in our contemporary society is there's a lot of sense of isolation. For sure. Right? Yes. We get where we go home, we're in our home, we, we we're not necessarily connecting with our neighbors anymore. We're certainly not um, for many of us not connecting with our other than human neighbors. Mm -hmm. 
right? The the plants and the and the and the animals and the the forms and forces that that shape the environments that we're part of, and that's we're all part of a shared community. It's not human versus nature. We are part of the natural world, and in relationship with that world. Mm -hmm. And and the more we can, we recognize that, and the more we take time to see where we are, the the deeper our sense of meaning is, then the deeper our sense of connection with and this. The, and to me, the, uh, my awareness is a deeper sense of responsibility. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, as we all know, with awareness comes responsibility. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Uh, I think for me, just thinking on the, about this conversation, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in photography. You know, my father used to take pictures and develop them in our basement using these chemicals. And, nice. you know, I ended up with the photography bug, too. Uh, and and but now I think I, I have a different level of understanding. It's not just a documentary of recording events as right. I've been, but, but as you have pointed out, the photo photographs serve multiple purposes. Yeah, and well, you can see them as as Ansel Adams and several others talked about as a crystallization of your experience mm -hmm. of your time in that moment, and so it's representing your state of being just as much as it's mm -hmm. representing what it's looking at. It's interesting that you yeah. say that, because um, looking, certainly looking at photographs, the photographs I take put me right back in that moment, and yeah. that's very exciting. Yeah. I do want to thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming, not only to share your words, but your beautiful images. Thank and you. I do thank you very much for coming here and talking about the four dimensions of photographic vision. I would like to thank also my, our club, Seraphimus International of Novato, for everyone's efforts in putting together this program. This is a volunteer crew, and uh, many people make this show happen. I'd also like to especially thank Leon Johnson, our studio engineer, and also the Buck Institute for Research on Aging here in Novato, who makes it possible for us to film these programs. My name is Madeline Peters of Seroptimus International of Novato. Thank you very much. Thank you.